We come now to God's Word. We're continuing on this morning in our series in Luke's Gospel. We are in Luke chapter 6 this morning. So I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We'll be reading together verses 27 through 36. That's Luke 6 verses 27 through 36. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, as we come now to your word, we do so asking for your help. We need your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds. We need him to prepare us to receive what you have for us. So ready us now, Father to hear from your word, that it would bear much fruit in us. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we continue on in our study of the Gospel of Luke, as we continue forward in the study of the Sermon on the Mount here, as Christ continues to instruct his disciples on what it looks like to follow him, what it means to be transformed by the gospel, he tells them here that one of the areas of transformation will be in the way that we love one another. Because Christian love is different than worldly love. Christ presents us here in this passage with a radically different love ethic than that offered by our culture. Christian love is different than worldly love. That's what Christ demonstrates here in Luke 6, 27 through 36. And how is Christian love different from worldly love? Worldly love says this, true love is whatever comes naturally. True love is whatever arises naturally from inside of you. True love is whatever feels right or natural to the individual. Christian love, the the love that Christ calls us to in this passage, he says that true love is not what comes naturally. He says that true love is what comes supernaturally. That is Christian love, love that comes to us supernaturally, love that comes only as the result of being transformed supernaturally by the gospel's work in us. But what does this supernatural Christian love look like? How does the the gospel begin to transform the way that we love one another? Well, in this passage this morning, Christ demonstrates to his disciples three ways, three ways in which the gospel transforms us. First, the gospel transforms who we love. Second, how we love. And finally, why we love. So first, the gospel transforms who we love. If you look back at just the first part of verse 27 with me, it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Now, it should not surprise us that 
Christ tells his disciples, he commands his disciples to love. Love is a a core aspect of what it means to be a part of the family of God. All the way back in Numbers 6, 5, we find the great commandment. The great commandment that says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Corresponding command in Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Written into the DNA of God's people is this idea of love, the principle that we are to be a people who love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, might, and strength, and and who love our neighbors as ourselves. This is a a, a core, bottom floor aspect of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, that even the Jews in Jesus' day would have understood this. But Jesus here goes even further than this command goes even further than the language of the great commandment. He doesn't just say, love your neighbors. He says, love your enemies. And this word that he used here, this word enemies, it means specifically someone who is personally hostile towards you. Someone personally hostile towards you. As we saw last week, we will be hated and rejected as Christians will be hated and rejected. How are we to respond to that hatred? Christ is clear here with love. We are to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us. The gospel transforms who we love. It is perfectly natural to love people who love us. It comes naturally. That's what Christ will go on to say in verse 32. Even sinners love those who love them. What is different about Christian love is that it is a love given to those who do not deserve it. A love given to those, even to those who are personally hostile towards us. It is not a natural way to love. It is an unnatural, supernatural way to love. And in this, Christ is actually demonstrating to us as his people what the great commandment actually means. When God instructs us to love him and to love our neighbor, he is not just telling us to do what comes naturally. To love in a way that just comes naturally to us. He's instructing us that we are to be a different type of people in him a supernatural people transformed by his love. And specifically what this means is that we are to be a people who reflect his love into this world. Because what is God's love like? Who is it that God loves? Those who love him? Those who can do something for him? The best and the brightest? Now, Christian, marvel at the love of God. As Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As it goes on to say in verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. This is who God loves. He loves his enemies. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That's what we'll go on to say later in this passage. He's unkind to the ungrateful and the evil. And he calls us as his children, as those made in his image, to do the same thing. To be merciful as he is merciful. It will not feel natural. In fact, it will feel very unnatural, but this is how the gospel begins to transform us. The good news that while we were yet God's enemies, he sent his son because he loves us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to redeem us from our sins. When this gospel begins to take root in our hearts, it will begin to transform us into a people who love in that same way. A people who are merciful, 
because God has been merciful to us, the people who love our enemies because we were loved when we were God's enemy. That is the first way the gospel transforms the way we love. It transforms who we love, but it also transforms how we love. What does it look like to love our enemies? That's what Christ goes on to explain in verses 27 through 31. He says, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do for you, do so to them. And as you wish... That others would do to you, do so to them. This statement here, it explains the, the new love ethic that Christ would have his followers embody. It gives us a principle for how to love our enemies. How would you want to be loved by your enemies? That's the question. How would you want to be loved by your enemies? Do so to them. Now, we might think that that sounds selfish, doesn't it? Just do to others what you would have them do unto you. But actually, this is a radically unselfish ethic. Because no one wants to be treated selfishly. No one wants to be used or taken advantage of. No one wants to be loved just for something they can do for another person. Part of what is built into us as people made in God's image is the desire to be loved unconditionally and unselfishly. That is why the love that so inspires our hearts and our minds is a love that is self-sacrificial. A a love that gives all and demands nothing back. Deep down in our heart of hearts, we all want to be loved like that, don't we? Unselfishly, self-sacrificially, we want that type of love. That is what Christ means here when he says, as you wish that others would do for you, do so to them. He's saying, love others, even your enemies, the way you want to be loved, unconditionally, self-sacrificially. This is difficult, and it's costly. We see this as Christ begins to explain to us what this type of love looks like. He says we should do good to those who hate us. This is what it looks like practically to love your enemies. Even if someone hates you, even if someone is personally hostile towards you, you are to seek their good. Notice that Christ is not not primarily interested in how we feel about our enemies. He's primarily interested in how we treat them. The love that Christ requires here is not just mere sentimentality. It is an active love done in self-sacrificial obedience because this type of love, active love in self-sacrificial obedience, this begins to form and shape our hearts towards other people. As C.S. Lewis writes, he says, Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. When Christ, then Christ goes on to say that we should bless those who curse us and pray for those who abuse us. You see, what we say about our enemies is just as important as what we do Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this is so crucial for us. This is so important for us. What is our first instinct when we're treated poorly? If we're honest, what is our first instinct when we are treated 
poorly, when we're sinned against, when we're hated, when we're abused, most of, our, most of us are perhaps too refined to lash out in physical violence. Oh, but we will lash out with our words, won't we? We will lash out with what we say. That's our first instinct to bless the heart of the person who has hurt us right down to size. To cut somebody down to size with, with vehement and scathing speech because they hurt us first. Christ calls us rather as the people of God to, cur- to pray for those who abuse us, to bless those who curse us. Christian, how do you talk about your enemies? This is a, a crucial question for Christians, because one of the things that is supposed to signify us as the people of God, one of the things that's supposed to signify us as Christians is what we do when we're sinned against. When somebody sins against us, do we begin to view that as a free pass to sin against them with our words? Would it not be so for the people of God How do you talk about those who have wronged you? Do you tear them down in the sight of others? Do you tear down their reputation in the sight of others? Or do you build them up? Do you assume the best or do you assume the worst? And most difficultly here, do you pray for your enemies? Isn't that a convicting word? Do you pray for even your enemies? This is the radical love, the radical, unnatural love that is to categorize us as Christians, that having been transformed by the gospel, we are able to even pray for our enemies, to pray for their good, to pray for their salvation, to pray for their forgiveness. And this is costly. Christ acknowledges this. To live like this means coming to terms with the fact that you will be taken advantage of. That's what Christ goes on to explain when he speaks of turning the other cheek and offering the shirt off your back and giving whatever to whoever begs from you. He's speaking about the fact, coming to terms with the fact that true Christian love will leave us vulnerable to getting taken for a ride and exploited. You will give and give and give and receive nothing back. And yet, he calls us to love this way nonetheless. He calls us to love self-sacrificially, even our enemies. But brothers and sisters, he does not call us to do something that he was not first willing to do himself. This is what Christ did isn't it? This is what Christ did for us on the cross. He demonstrated to us how to love our enemies self-sacrificially. That's what Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is how Christ loved his enemies. He did good for those who hated him. He gave his life for them. He blessed those who cursed him. He prayed to his father as he hung on a cross. He prayed for his enemies, those who were abusing, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is the love of Christ. A Christian love that is different from worldly love. It is not natural. It is supernatural. We cannot show this type of love in our own strength, in our own power. But brothers and sisters, in Christ, by the power of His Holy Spirit, we can. R.C. Sproul, commenting on this, passage, he challenged his readers on how to 
practically demonstrate this type of love, on how to practically demonstrate this self-sacrificial, supernatural love, I'll challenge you to the same thing he challenged his readers to. I want you to take a moment to think about someone in your life. Think about one person. Think about someone in your life that you have conflict with or that you had conflict with. Maybe even someone who you might consider an enemy. Don't think about everybody. Just think about one person, the first person that comes to mind, the most prominent person. And I want you to consider praying for that person for the next 30 days faithfully interceding before the Father on their behalf. Pray for their good and welfare. Pray for your heart towards them. If you've sinned against them by gossip, slander, or bitterness, unforgiveness, confess it. Pray that you would be able to forgive them. Pray that God would forgive them. I want you to consider doing this for the next 30 days. See what the Lord does in your heart towards that person. And then most importantly, go talk to them. Make peace with them. This is how the Lord calls us to love, to pray even for our enemies. In this passage, we see who we love, how we love, and finally, the gospel transforms why we love why we love. And this last point is so crucial because it serves as the foundation of all the other points. Because why we love, our motivation will impact who we love and how we love. Our our motivation for loving matters incredibly. Here's what I mean. If we love just to receive another person's love in return, We will only ever love those who are lovable and lovely. We will only ever love those who can do something back for us. That's not Christian love. If our motivation is to keep up appearances and perform, if that's why we love others so that other people will see, we will only ever do just the bare minimum to get by. And that's not Christian love. Christian love is different than worldly love. The ability to love, as Christ calls us to in this passage, begins with our why changing. It begins with our internal motivation changing. Until this happens, we'll love just like the world. What is this new motivation? What is this new why? We read of in verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. As followers of Christ, we love our neighbors, even our enemies, because we're promised that when we do so, our reward will be great. Now again, when we begin to think that this perhaps sounds a little bit selfish, that we're just doing it for the reward, we need to understand what the reward is. We need to keep reading. You will be sons of the Most High. That's the reward. What Christ is not saying here is that when you love like this, you earn the right to become a part of the family of God. So work hard, earn it, and this will be your reward. That's not what he's saying here. This language that he uses here, it's the language of family resemblance. What Christ means here is that when you love like this, when you embody Christian love, you have the great reward of being like your father. And like a son resembles and represents his father, you resemble and represent your father here on earth when you love in this way. Christian, when you love like this, in a supernatural Christian love, when you love like this, you get to embody your father's love to the world, the great reward. Why do we love? We love because we want to be like our Father. We love because we want to resemble and represent Him here on earth. Benjamin is 
just now getting to the age where he wants to be like his daddy. And that brings such joy to my heart when we go out and perhaps we're going fishing or something like that. If I'm wearing a blue shirt and a hat and sunglasses, he wants to make sure he's wearing a, a blue shirt and a hat and sunglasses. He wants to look just like his daddy. Sometimes he'll come up to me and he'll, he'll point to the hair on his arm. He said, Daddy, look, I have hair on my arm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a man like you someday. I'm going to have a beard like my daddy. I don't have the heart to tell him what's going to happen to the rest of the hair on his head, but I tell him, yeah, yes, buddy, someday you are going to be like your daddy. Brothers and sisters, we should desire to be like our father, to resemble and represent him here on this earth. This is what we do when we love as he loves, self-sacrificially, even our enemies, no matter the cost, and there will be a cost, we're promised that our reward will be greater. The reward of loving, knowing, and representing our Father. Would we love like that? Let's go to him in prayer and ask for his help with that. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we need your help to love like this. We praise you for your magnificent mercy towards us in your Son, that although we are your enemies, we were your enemies, that by the blood of Christ, you've reconciled us to you through faith. Would the love of Christ dwell richly in our hearts, cause your gospel to transform us, Father. Cause it to transform the way that we love one another. We want to love as you love us. So help us, we pray. Fill us with your spirit that we may bear much fruit. Keep us from loving selfishly. Would we never lose our amazement at your love for us, for your love for ungrateful sinners like us. Work in us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.